Great. So welcome, everybody. Uh, this show of The Latest With is going to focus on veterinary stem cells. And I have with me today both a friend and a colleague, Dr. Julie Ryan Johnson, who is a veterinarian in the Southern California area up in, in uh, near Dana Point. She and her husband, Gary Johnson, uh, own a hospital, their small animal hospital, at which she works at. That's one of her jobs. Uh, she also is involved in a lot of charities and involved in shelters. In fact, at one time, she was the director of one of the largest public shelters uh, in all the United States. And I'll ask you a little bit about that later, Julie. But welcome to the discussion about veterinary stem cells. Thanks for agreeing to be here. Oh, thanks for asking. Great. And so Julie has an interesting background. She's a veterinarian graduated in, in 1990 from the University of Wisconsin, which I'm sure probably has about three feet of snow on the ground right now, um, and then went on to an internship um, at the Virginia, Maryland School of Veterinary Medicine in large animal medicine. So she spent an additional year in very intense looking at medicine and then uh, actually ended up in industry working with companies, much like Vetstem, which is a company I work with, in delivering medical care of various kinds and products to the industry. And so, Julie, is, could you like maybe real briefly describe why, why in the world you decided you wanted to become a veterinarian? I think that's useful well, for people for, to know. I think for a lot of us, it's kind of a foregone conclusion. We already know that that's what we want to do. We're passionate about animals. And I was really lucky to have a mentor early on. I started working in the veterinary clinic at 11. And the veterinarian that I worked for really encouraged me. Um, the teachers really encouraged okay. me. I really enjoyed the work. Great. And Julie and I actually met at several veterinary conventions where she came by our vet stem booth, and that's the company that delivers this stem cell technology to veterinarians with kind of a puzzled look on her face, like, what is this stem cell thing? Is it real? Who are you? And, and not too long after that, we became acquainted, and Julie's been involved the last several years in actually helping us deliver the education to veterinarians about what stem cells really are, because none of us, even new graduates, really have a lot of background and training because this field is literally just brand new. Um, in the clinic. There's been research going on for many, many years, but this is pretty new. Today, the goal is to talk about how stem cells um, have function and have been used in service animals. And as those of you know, in the military, in the police departments, in search and rescue, and emergency crews, use dogs a lot. And so I'm going to call on, on Dr. Ryan's expertise today because she's had specific hands-on experience with a number of cases. And, and we can talk through a couple of particular cases today where stem cells were used to help an animal either get back to work or recover from fairly severe injuries. So Julie, how, first of all, how, how did you get involved in the shelter work and the work with the police dogs? Because that was sort of pre when I knew you. Well, somehow I fell into the shelter work. Um, I actually had a few kittens come into the clinic I was working in, and they had pan leukopenia. And from there, that kind of led me to research what a shelter veterinarian was. Yeah. And once I started um, kind of working part-time, I fell in love with it and then decided to go full-time and make that my career for a while. And, it, you know, once you're involved in shelter medicine, it's, a, it's kind of a calling. <laughs> there's a lot of really good days and there's some bad days, but most yeah. of the time you just really focus on all the great things you can do. And it was actually through the shelter that I started working with the police dogs. Um, I worked with the Orange County um, Sheriff's Department and all their police dogs, both the bomb dogs mm -hmm. and um, we call them the bad guy dogs, yeah. out there on the street. And that was a really, it actually made my job extremely exciting. Excellent. And, and contrary to popular belief, those folks struggle with the economics of treatment of their animals and keeping them in work, but they're very expensive animals, as I understand, to actually get them trained where they're really now a useful member of either a police squad, a bomb team, something like that. Is, is that in fact true? There's a huge investment by the police department. A lot of times the local cities, um, like the Rotary Clubs, will help raise money so that that city can have a police dog. So it's a very big financial investment. These dogs are anywhere from ten to twelve thousand um, dollars. Some of them are imported from Europe. Some of them come over from, like Lachlan over in Texas. Mm -hmm. So there's a you know a big financial commitment to these dogs. They are highly trained athletes. Um, they come over. They are have very clean X-rays, but then they put them right to work. And one of the first things I noticed is that these young dogs got arthritis so early on. 
I couldn't believe the x-rays I was seeing from like three and four year old dogs. They just looked so much older by x-ray. Uh, excellent. And, and I'm sort of a livestock guy from background. And when we first met, you started educating me about the small animal world and that there were these hugely talented athletes like these police dogs, like the agility dogs, and they had all the same injuries that large animals have, horses that we'd already worked with. So in about 2008, we started working on the dog and really trying to deliver the stem cell technology. And and uh, hopefully we'll get to it later. I'm going to show a video of how we actually collect the fat. But why don't you tell us a little about uh, one of the dogs that we're talking about, which is Gogo, which is one, I think, right close to you there in, in Orange County. Right. Gogo was a, um, a bomb dog um, at the Orange County Airport. And his job was to search airplanes, search the airport. And he was um, just a fantastic dog. I mean, he, he had record speed. He was very, very agile. Um, part of their job is to, you know, go over the, go into big cargo holds, jump up and down boxes. So it's, um, they've got to be a pretty good athlete to do all, to do their work. And they do it every day. So it's a lot of repetition training. And it kind of does set them up for arthritis. So Gogo had probably one of the biggest hearts I've seen. Um, he'd do anything despite his pain level. He was incredibly stoic. Um, over time, he had significant arthritis in both elbows. And his gait was really affected, but his brain still wanted to go work. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a huge problem with these dogs. They are so tuned in to their job. They will do anything through pain. They really aren't athletes. So they're like anybody who watched the Chargers on Sunday and you see people playing through pain. Um, and these, these athletes will do the same thing, but it certainly impacts their ability to do work. I've got a video I want to key up, Julie. Hopefully you'll be able to see it too. And this is a, a pre-stem cell video of Gogo. Um, so you can take a look and see at least uh, how Gogo is feeling. I'll get it on full screen for you. So this is on YouTube, so give us a second. So Julie, when this keys up, hopefully you can see that as well. And I've got the sound turned off, so maybe you can describe a little bit. Let's see if this is gonna go. Try one more time here. There we go. Can you see that okay, Julie? Yeah, I can see that. Okay, there, that is going up a slight incline at my hospital. And you can see there, um, Gogo's right. left front leg, um, how much he lifts his head to get off that left front leg. Um, he's significantly lame on that left elbow. Yeah, I'm not very good at picking out lameness. Is this one even I can see that that he's pretty sore? And at this point, Gogo had now stopped working because of the lameness. Is that correct? Right. Gogo was retired, but um, the bond between the handler and the dog is incredible. Um, they they've been together for years. They've been a, they work as a team. Um, they have <laughs> they respect each other. And so this handler really wanted to make sure that Gogo had a great retirement, that he retired with dignity, and that he was as comfortable as he could possibly make him. And we okay. had actually exhausted all other traditional means. Um, and I had mentioned stem cells a few times to him, and he was always very much on okay. board. So um, we decided that would be our uh, retirement present to Gogo. Julie, what other kinds of therapy would they have tried already that people would be aware of? Well, generally, people will start with um, painkillers or non-steroidals, um, and there's different brands on the market, and one doesn't work, they'll try another. Um, they'll try adding chondroitin sulfate into their diets. Um, I usually start the police dogs on Adequan injections when they're about five prophylactically. Um, mm -hmm. If they're lucky enough to have a rehab center, they'll do some rehab work, which is always great and a good adjunct to anything. Mm -hmm. And there's always, you know, laser treatment. But... We'd gone through all those things, and unfortunately um, for Gogo, they were just not that effective. And uh, Gogo also has something that probably about 5%, 10% of the dogs do. He could not tolerate the non -steroidals. Uh um, So that, that, that would mean, Julie, that, that li liver and kidney and other things would be affected by the drug, so that's why you might not well, tolerate? Yeah, he would kind of worry us because any time we tried him on a different painkiller, he would have vomiting and diarrhea for several mm -hmm. days. But so describe a little bit then the process for people who haven't heard about how this stem cell therapy works from, from vet stem. How did the process go? 
and, and maybe just do it just in brief, like sort of beginning through the end of the process, what we do. Okay. So what happens is the animal first has to be cleared for surgery because there is a minor surgery. Um, and a lot of them can be older dogs. Doga was about, I think about 10, 11 years old. So we want to make sure his kidney and liver were fine. Um, did some blood, routine blood work and was cleared for anesthesia and surgery. And then a small sample of fat was collected from inside his abdomen. A small incision, maybe about an inch, two inches at the most, was made into his abdomen. Um, fat was sterilely collected. It was shipped overnight to vet stem. Um, at, in the vet stem laboratory, they opened it under a hood. Everything was kind of in a biohazard suit. <laughs> and they, uh, from there, they concentrate the stem cells. They put it back into syringes and ship it back overnight to the veterinarian. Um, and then from there, the veterinarian will inject it into the joints that are most effective. Great. I'm going to show a, a brief video. And, and if we can, I want to turn the audio off so it's not interrupting. And I'll sort of describe, chime in, Julie. This is a picture of vet stem and uh, the, let's see if we can get this to full screen as well. There we go. Good. So this is the inside of the vet stem offices and laboratory in San Diego. And we built a laboratory that really runs very much the same as any human stem cell lab would run. In fact, I've had some human stem cell lab folks tour through and say they were uh, sort of blown away with what the lab looked like in terms of being high quality and sterile, as Dr. Ryan was describing. And, and the intent is, as, as she described, the fat sample would come in to vet stem. And then they would go through a whole series of quality control. And so they want to make sure that it's clean, that it's the right sample. And the picture you're seeing now, we're actually going to take a walk into the back room. And the sterile hoods you see where, where the technicians sitting in their blue outfits are, those are sterile air. And so the sample from your pet never gets opened unless it's in this sterile hood. And we process the sample, and it's a little small piece of fat, again, as Dr. Ryan described, like from a spay. And it's chopped up. We use a little digestive enzyme to let the fat separate. And these little stem cells are heavier than the fat, and we can spin them to the bottom and collect a huge concentration of these stem cells. Stem cells from fat. 1,000 times more concentrated than stem cells in bone marrow. Yeah, you heard that right. It's a total surprise. They're actually patented because it was such a surprise. But if you reach over and pinch your little fat on the side of your, your waist, that's your stem cell storage device. You have billions and billions of stem cells that help replace the stem cells as they get used up in your body.